Good morning again. Good morning to uh, those joining us from Lena Valley and, and those on, on Facebook. Excited to uh, be able to bring you God's Word today. Uh, of course, we've been going through our series on Radically Different. And uh, today, uh, we're going to be particularly looking at how that affects or how that comes across in our relationships. Last week, uh, Matt covered about uh, radical growth and he talked about how we are, to, as we mature in Christ, how that can impact on our, on our culture. Today, we're switching that analogy a little bit of, of that maturing into the putting on of Christ and how that impacts our relationships. Now, we see that maturity in all good movies, don't we? That, that, that good uh, character development where at the start they might be fumbling, they don't know who they are, and then by the end they, they stand up, they know who they are. I'm probably, maybe that's just my experience for all the superhero movies I love watching. But I think that's generally common across most movies. And I, you know, I love my actions, love the sci-fi adventure. Even Marie is brought in my uh, library of, rom -com, of uh, rom-coms. I think that's what they call it, aren't they? But a couple of weeks ago, Maria and I, we, we watched this movie, and to start with, I wasn't really keen to watch it. It was, uh, I think they call it a, a coming-of-age movie. But I actually, it actually really hooked me by the end. I was quite surprised. The story was pretty relatable. It was, it was, or at least possible, not relatable to myself personally, as it was about a young girl, but relatable that it could happen. It was about a girl that uh, she had trouble, had difficulty connecting with uh, people. She didn't really get on with her mum, and, and she had this brother, I don't know if it was the, her twin, or at least he was a similar age, where he was, he was the perfect child. You know, he was the one that mummy loved, and, and uh, he seemed to just have everything going for him. She did, however, have a great relationship with her father, but which got taken away from her tragically as she witnessed his death um, by heart attack. Her foundation and her hope had been taken away. However, that tragedy did have some good points. It, it came into a, a new relationship with this kind friend. They, they had this bond and, and they supported each other through those kind of instances, uh, through those, those personal and social changes. But once again, this was, was ripped away from her as her friend started dating her brother, the perfect one, who had everything. And here, again, he had taken uh, the one thing that she, uh, her one friend. She was alone once again. To begin with, she tried to be supportive. You know, she tried to say, yeah, it's fine, I'm all cool with this. Um, but that disappointment just turned to bitterness and turned to anger, and it just, it just went downhill. It, it was quite a mess to watch. But I believe there was this, this clear scene that was the turning point. And it came as she cried out to God, sitting on the toilet. Of course, where all good deep reflection comes from, on the toilet. And she cries out to God, look, you've never given me anything good. Why can't you just give me a break? Why can't, for once, I have something good? And obviously, the directors just wanted to nail the point home that she uh, wasn't getting a break because she reached over the toilet paper and there's none there. Again, she just can't catch a break. But I do think from that moment on, you do start to see a change because what happens is the truth comes out. Uh, it comes out through a built-up of anger, but nevertheless, it comes out. She finally tells her brother how she feels about being in his shadow, how he doesn't seem to care about how his actions affect her. And he also responds with how all his life he's felt the pressure of having to be the mature one all the time and the decisions he has to make that has affected the family uh, and held them together that she would be unaware of. The truth comes out and she finally sees that there's a perspective greater than her own, greater than the stuff that's going on in her life. I mean, how often can this synopsis be true for us? I mean, the movie is just simply it was conflict in relationship because the characters only focused on themselves, on their own stuff that was going on in their life. Why do we put off the truth? Why do we cause others to go through, uh, why do we, we cause ourselves to go through so much pain and anger? Why do we always want to cut the corners and, and go to the good bits of relationships instead of working hard at them? Paul actually really has a name for this, he calls it our old self. Our old self is corrupted by our desires. Our old self only focuses on our own stuff. 
Radical relationship is removing of the old ways and putting on our new self and being Christ-centered. And Paul says this, as you look on the screens there, in uh, Ephesians 4. He says, When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, we were taught with regard to your former life, your former way of life, to put off your old self, which has been corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in the true righteousness and holiness. Paul is telling us that in our conversion of Christ, he's made us into a new creation. Our old self, there's the old self, there's the new self. There's the corruption, there's creation. There's passion and deceit, and there's holiness and purity. What was made in Adam and what was made in Christ are uh, incompatible. Our new, we are to put on a new, new clothes, to put on a new self. And these new clothes, these new behaviours, and really a new ethical lifestyle. And I'm not talking simply of slipping on a, a T-shirt that, that has a big cross on it or a, a WWJD band or maybe even some robes to make yourself look pretty holy. What we're talking about here is a life and a relationship with others that sounds, looks, and behaves a bit like what Jesus would if he was here with us. So let's, let's get practical. What does radical relationship look like? Paul dives pretty, pretty head in. He talks here about four behaviours which must change from our old self to our new self in radical relationships. I'm just going to quickly go over the, the three points, but we're going to go in depth of these. But the first one being falsehood. We must remove the mask and the lies that hide behind us behind this and distance ourselves, it causes us to distance ourselves from others. And anger, we must watch our tempers. It's not to be used to hurt others. Stealing, we must take off our gloves and use our hands to benefit the community and not take from it. And he also has other points, the fourth being uh, evil talk, which Matt will cover uh, next week. But let's just dive in on those three. Being in the community of truth and, and how uh, we are to take off that old self and put on the new mentions there in Ephesians 25, therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbour, for we are all members of one body. I mean, firstly, uh, commentaries can connect, connect this passage to uh, Zechariah 8.16, to, which says to speak, uh, to speak truth to one another, and this is to be done, I believe, as a covenant of believers, uh, as the body. We are to speak truthfully to one another. That's, that's our covenant of, of, of being in the body. To provide a, a safe place for church, to be a church and a truthful place. And I think this is generally true, but, and, and that we have pretty good lie detectors, yet aren't we in a world that's full of the, the word fake news? You know, the, I think these days it's nearly impossible to know the information that you get is reliable. You nearly need to fact check uh, most media sources. Uh, yeah, it's, it's difficult to get any information that isn't unbiased or, or a certain slant. For example, uh, and I'm hitting a pretty soft target here with the, uh, the magazines, but uh, I used to work with, with someone that said that their, uh, their brother was the publicist for uh, the Hewitts. And, of course, you see their pictures in a lot of those magazines about uh, different things going on, different tragedies. But uh, one of these uh, stories was actually about how uh, Beck Hewitt had found another man or was cheating on, on Leighton, and they had a big picture of her hugging this man. And uh, he was telling me, that's, that's just her brother. He's just <laughs> she's just hugging her brother. But from the photo, you know, they were able to make this, this big story of... of, of whatever you could make from it. You know, we, we really do need to guard ourselves against contributing or spreading uh, these kinds of, of lies. But I also want to put to you that we need to also be letting our, our guard down uh, when we are in the safety of fellow believers. I mean, how do you go with this question? Uh, how are you going? How are you going? Most of the time, our pretty quick response is, is good. I reckon uh, probably 60 to 70% of the time that's probably a truthful answer. But 
but sometimes it's, it's like, well, yeah, things are not probably going that great. And uh, maybe, truth be told, the other person has maybe not got 10 minutes to go through a deep um, connection of, of what's going on in your world. But generally, I think if that question is asked around here, we really should be thinking, well, how, how am I doing? How, uh, how is life right now? And how can I be uh, open and honest? So, Falsehood, uh, to me, as I was reading this, really come across as a bit of a mask, and that's something that I uh, feel like uh, I can do as well, is, is put on a mask that, that everything's going all right or, or, or things are fine. I was especially challenged um, about this with the question of, uh, is your life worth imitating and who's close enough to see it? Initially, that question struck me because I felt I was too busy for people to, to be able to see what's going on in my life. But secondly, I've, as I kind of unpacked it a bit more, it's like, well, actually, what is the mask that I put on that, that people are seeing of how I live? Am I actually letting people in close enough to see what life's really like? How I manage difficulties and how I respond to those things? It's very easy on Facebook, isn't it, to see people's highlights reels of uh, what's going on in their life and just see the good bits um, and and not really know truly what's going on for that person. We've heard plenty about you uh, 2 and what they have to say on these subjects, but a band I quite enjoy listening to that's from this decade is uh, Paramore, who uh, they wrote this song called Fake Happy. It came out this year. And the lines go like this. It says, I've been doing a good job making them think I'm quite all right, but I hope I don't blink. You see, it's easy when I'm stomping on a beat but no, no one sees when I'm crawling back underneath. It's very easy to be putting off a facade of things are all right, things are fine, but really underneath, uh, things are not all right. When we put on this mask of everything is all right, we actually distance ourselves from others. We distance ourselves from having a real relationship with others, which can get lonely. Also, this mask can get, uh, get passed on to the next generation who are wanting to imitate how we respond to difficulties and, and, and struggles. It can create a culture of carrying our own stuff and not actually being open about how we, how we handle things. I think uh, when we come in the door here for church, really, uh, we should have a sign there saying, all masks, please be left here. You know, this is a safe place. But I'm sorry to tell you, you're not going to be able to collect it on your way out. We're, we're confiscating those things. We, we are to be new creations. We are to be vulnerable and open to each other. Not to avoid the truth or the lessons that can be passed on through that brokenness. Uh, an author that is well known, the author of Amazing Grace, John Newton, he knew a thing or two about brokenness. He lost his mother and his faith at a young age, and Newton became a slave driver, a slave trader, and even spending some time as a slave himself. He was nicknamed Captain Blasphemer because of his language and his behaviour. But one day, after crying out for mercy for his crew as he stood at the helm of his ship trying to steer through a storm for two hours while his crew were underneath trying to plug the holes, he came out the other side of that experience and, and gave his life to Christ and walked away from his life uh, of, of sin. But he never forgot it. He was always open about his struggles and what he's come from. It even, gave him, it even made it difficult for him to be ordained because he was so open about his past. And now it's captured in the wonderful song, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. This experience that he had and, and even the whistle blowing that, of the treatment of African slaves was what ignited William Wilberforce in his effort to abolish slavery. Imagine a church of real people open and truthful about life, struggles and past experiences which are filled with amazing grace sharing our desperate need for Jesus, for Christ. A body of believers that teach and model this to the next generation of how to walk through doubts, pains and brokenness and come out the other side. Well, I don't think we should just imagine that. I think 
let's, let's take off that falsehood. Let's experience that radical relationship today. That's what Paul is encouraging us to do. Second thing he says is, is be angry without sin. I find this quite interesting. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not let the devil get a foothold. Notice Paul does not say, do not be angry, but he actually says, in your anger, do not sin. Anger can often uh, bring our true emotions and the truth itself to the surface. When we have been trying to bottle it up or, or haven't really confronted it properly, I mean, we see that pretty clearly in the story of Cain and Abel, when both of them were, were giving the, the best of their, their fruits and, and uh, the lamb, the, their, the first of the, the flock. But of course, Cain gets a little bit angry that, his, uh, that Abel's offering is, is being better received than his own. And, and God says to him, your anger is allowing sin to crouch at the door. The sinful outcomes of that was, of course, murder. Uh, and harm. But equally, in God's eyes, gossip, which is the spreading of of malicious words or or even silence and unforgiveness, can equally be damaging to our relationships around us. Jesus, on the Sermon of the Mount, speaks out against this kind of anger and likens it to uh, damaging our relationships is equal to murder. Paul here repeats Jesus' teaching that if it's not dealt with urgently uh, before leading to sin, then, uh, yeah, it causes pain, it causes uh, disruption. Of course, there are plenty of examples, too, of righteous anger. And men and women throughout the Bible that have become angry because of injustice or evil that they see in the world. Jesus himself is known for, for tossing a few tables in his anger throughout the gosp- in the Gospels because the temple, his father's house, had been turned into a marketplace. There was evidence of, of corruption and, and uh, it spat in the face of, of God and His holiness, the holiness of the temple. Jesus got angry at that evil and that, that had infiltrated such a holy place. And I, I see no conflict with the Scriptures that we too should turn away from being... Uh, should not turn away from being angry about the evil in the world, as long as it leaves, as long as it leads to action and resolution. This weekend, we actually remember 500 years since the uh, Reformation. I believe it's actually on, on Tuesday is the same date. I was told uh, yesterday, but we're, this is 500 years since that day, when a, a German priest or monk, depends on what you consider. Uh, yeah, went and went up against the Roman Catholic Church uh, because he believed they were acting unchristian. He was angry with the priests that were indulging themselves on get out of jail free cards uh, that they were giving to, well, that they were uh, asking people to pay for in order to get their salvation. Martin Luther believed that it was faith alone that brought salvation, not through good works or wealth but God given, God given freely. And so Luther did something about it. He nailed his 95 Thesis to the door of the Roman Catholic Church, which started uh, the debate and the movement of churches we have today. Quite crazy to think all the different denominations we have now uh, are because of that, that day in history. Because at that stage, there was just the one church and that was the one way to God. Righteous anger, our burning passion inside to see God's kingdom come on earth, can be an inspiring vision for our lives that can change the course of history. We are not to just turn away from our righteous anger, but at the same time we must make sure that we're not allowing our fallenness, which is constantly prone to our own self-indulgences and pride, to get in the way. With anger, Paul gives us clear parameters when it is righteous and when it's turning into something sinful. He he gives us three disclaimers. Firstly, simply, you must not sin. Anger must be free from injured pride, from spite, from malice, from animosity, and from the spirit of, of revenge. Like the parable of 
the unforgiving debtor when, he can't, when the king is taking account of um, his money and, and he finds that someone owes him, let's say, a million dollars and, and uh, he brings the debtor before him and he says, please forgive me uh, or, or give me time to pay back the debt and the king has mercy on him and, and uh, wipes that debt clean. Yet that same debtor then goes to someone that owes him far less and says, pay me that money. Uh, how can we be angry at people when we ourselves have been forgiven so much? Of what, you know, we deserve God's anger and wrath for the old self, for our, our sin. The sin that meant Jesus had to go to the cross to open up that relationship with God again. Yet, God offers this forgiveness and grace freely. And so, we are to be slow to anger. We are to make sure that our anger is not with sin. Secondly, do not let the sun go down on your anger. You are to deal with it immediately and not allow it to lengthen into revenge or sinful thoughts and selfish thoughts. If you're angry with someone, go to them. Go to them directly to, and, and, and get to the truth. Don't allow that anger to bottle up and go, as I mentioned in that story or in that movie, go, I don't know what it was, 18, uh, 17 years of, of, of bottled up anger uh, until finally the truth comes out. Go and do it immediately. If it, if it is coming from a place of selfishness, then ask for forgiveness. If it's coming from a place of righteousness, then do something about it and don't let the sun go down. Thirdly, give no opportunity to the devil. The devil knows how, to fi how fine a line it is between righteousness and unrighteous anger and how hard it is for us not to step over that line, to handle our anger responsibly. So he loves to lurk around angry people, hoping to be able to exploit the situation to his own advantage and by provoking them towards hatred or towards violence, a breach of the fellowship. We do not give the devil a foothold. And finally, he, Paul talks about transformation. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. As I was trying to uh, understand this passage, commentaries kind of treated this, these verses with, uh, this verse with, uh, in two ways. Firstly, there's kind of the broader context that uh, on the word stealing, um, capturing that eighth command, do not steal. And so telling us that whether, you know, stealing from a store or, or committing uh, tax evasion, cutting corners in business, taking advantage of a welfare system, when you are an able body to work, well, you're to repent from that because that is a behaviour not fitting of the new self, the new life that we are to live. The other line of thought which builds on this thinking, but would more define this use of the language stealing as maybe someone that is more of a, uh, a criminal, uh, a career criminal in this sense, is actually sim uh, symbolic of transformation. For when someone in that line of work, profiting from others' hard work, takes off their old ways and become a contributor to society, that kind of transformation can only come from knowing and following Jesus. In this way, this example goes back to the theme of what Paul's message is all about, the taking off of our old self and the beginning of a new creation, taking our eyes off ourselves like the thief that grants, which gains their own benefit at the cost of others. We are to, co to cast off sin and become a community of believers that value others and contribute and support one another. I was actually uh, challenged to this, uh, so last week I was uh, at Arrow, and we were talking about vision for our lives and looking at the, the story of Moses and the burning bush. And I, I asked the question of, well, do we need a sign? You know, do we need the audible voice of God to, to finally know what our vision for our life should be? Because you know, that would really be helpful if um, we could have that audible voice. And uh, the teacher said back to me, well, has there never been a time in your life where you've experienced a, a miracle or a, or a breakthrough or transformation? And, and it made me think, and, and straight away, 
I was convicted with the fact that for, well, since uh, through high school and, and, and a, de a decade of, of uh, struggle with, with addiction has gone, it, it took a long time, but it's gone through focusing on Jesus, through continually daily taking off my old self and putting on my new, and now being in a place where I can see that that is a miracle that God has been able to do. He's been able to take that out of my life and give me a new creation. And I, it's never to underestimate that power. It's never un, to underestimate that miracle that God can do in transforming us from our old self to our new. I'm sure Peter is not strictly here talking about a thief, but I'm sure there's quite a range of things where we see transformation in people's lives that uh, is to be celebrated, is to be uh, talked about, and as I mentioned earlier there, about talking about those places of amazing grace that God has been able to pull us from and, and should be... Um, what we, how, yeah, that brings us into radical relationship. So in summary, let me just conclude that our radical relationships should be covered in truth, to be real and vulnerable with one another. We need to take off those masks. Our radical relationships should handle anger head-on and stir us into action against evil, not to cause us to do evil. Our radical relationship should mean we work hard at contributing to community and be able to support one another, not working for ourselves but for the community. And I think today the shoeboxes are a great example of using what, what we've been given to help the broader community. So let's, let's praise God. Let's, let's thank him. Lord, we, we do just want to thank you for your design uh, for a relationship, for radical relationship. We thank you uh, for the words of Paul and to take off our old self, take, taking off daily that sin that, uh, that creeps into our life, that, that old self of, of how we used to think, of how we used to go about things, of how we used to hide things from others. Lord, may we bring that uh, openly to you and to uh, the body of believers to be able to be built up to support and encourage one another, Lord. We just thank you uh, for your words and thank you for the transformation that you do in our lives, for the, the death and resurrection uh, of the cross that allowed us to once again walk with you, to experience that amazing grace, to come from whatever life, Lord, we used to walk in, to, to being part of your family, being part of your inheritance, Lord, of the kingdom of God. That is an exciting place to be, Lord, and we... Praise and honour you for that, that you invite us into that family. May you take from us, Lord, our mask, may you take our gloves, may you take uh, any anger that is towards our brothers and sisters and use those things to glorify your name in truth, in uh, burning passion and in uh, fruitfulness for the community, Lord, in your name. Amen.